So we've mentioned aqueous solutions before, just sort of in passing. Um, that's one of our sort of states that we use in chemical reactions. You have uh, solid, which is S, liquid, or sometimes written as a, a cursive L, usually how I do it, and then gas, and then aqueous is AQ. So aqueous, an aqueous solution is a homogeneous, sorry, not homogeneous, homogeneous, they're slightly different, mixture of a substance with water. Pretty much all of the reactions that we do in this class, actually if I can think, I think every reaction we do is going to be in an aqueous solution. So, um, some compounds react differently to water than others. Ionic compounds dissociate. So, uh, when they dissolve in water, this is like if you're adding salt, table salt to water, right? It disappears, the water becomes clear, um, and those ions are dissociating into their component ions. So you're going from NaCl to Na plus, plus, uh, not OH, Cl minus. Uh, it's the opposite of associate. So if like I associate myself with somebody, I'm like, so we're associated, we're hanging out, sort of like connected. And then, yeah, to dissociate is like they, yeah, separate from each other. Um, Dissolve yeah, okay. yeah. I think we'll talk about things that don't dissociate, but dissolve in water. If we don't, I'll, I'll mention at least one. Um, so yeah, by stirring table salt, sodium chloride in water, um, it seems to disappear um, because the liquid becomes clear again, but if you taste the salt water, it's salty. So in sodium chloride solution, there are none of the original NaCl together units. They've all been split apart, and so that's what this diagram, this picture is showing, that we have these individual sodium ions and these individual chloride ions. So substances that do this, that dissociate completely, are called strong electrolytes. I think actually today's lab, it's either today's lab or next week's lab, um, we're gonna look at strong electrolytes. They also, uh, conduct electricity. So in pure water, there are no ions in pure water. And so water cannot be conducted across them, right? In any electrical circuit, there's a positive end and there's a negative end. If you touch the positive to the ed negative end, you get sparks. Um, it's actually one of the things you're not supposed to do when you're like jumping your car battery. We've had to do that before. Um, if you connect both the ends to the battery, you do not want to connect the other ends because then you finish a circuit, or you complete a circuit, and then all of the juice runs out of the battery through the circuit until they catch on fire, or through the cables, until the cables sometimes catch on fire, or melt, or worse. Um, so the ions, though, from sodium chloride, my screen here got messed up, they provide these positive and negative charges, and so they're actually ferrying electrons across the water uh, to complete a circuit. So if we have a strong electrolyte solution, this will light up as if it's connected with a wire. We also have weak electrolyte solutions. Um, I don't think we have a slide on them specifically, but there are weak solutions, and um, they don't produce nearly as many ions as a strong electrolyte. And so when you connect or complete a circuit through a weak electrolyte solution, you get some electricity, but just a little bit. And so instead of being as if it's connected with, directly with wires, it'll be a really dim light, like putting a resistor in between. Uh, so silver nitrate is another liquid, or is another solid that will dissolve in water. Uh, it's an ionic compound, because starting with a metal. Um, and then it also completely dissociates. So it's a strong electrolyte solution. Now, the thing that's special about silver nitrate is that we have individual nitrate ions. So you think of this as a molecular 
ion. A polyatomic ion is a molecular ion. So it exists as, you can see here, yeah, those barely show up as red, but there's the blue in the middle, that's the nitrogen, and then the oxygens are all attached to that. And so when you put silver nitrate into solution, the nitrate polyatomic ions, they stay together as a unit. They don't split and dissociate from the oxygen atoms. Uh, silver, well, the silver and nitrate do dissociate. The oxygens do not dissociate from the nitrogen. The other example, let me just check. Okay, yeah, so we're not going to get one. So, yeah, this is an exa another example of dissociation. If you add sugar to water, those sugar molecules um, do not really dissociate from each other. They're not chemically bound to each other. And so when you add that to water, they get pulled apart by the little water molecules, um, but they stay as complete sugar molecules. So their formula stays the same when they're added to a solution. So here we're taking the chemical formula of AgNO3, and we're breaking it apart into two new chemical formulas, the Ag plus and the NO3 minus. Um, I cannot remember what the chemical formula for sugar is. Um, let's try this. Hey Siri, what's the molecular formula for sucrose? Here's what I found from careers360.com. It has the chemical formula C12H22O11. So that's sucrose, C12H22O11, which is table sugar. Um, and when you add this to water, you can add solid table sugar to water and it will become C12H22O11 aqueous. And this could be solid, and this would be aqueous, and this would be aqueous. So when you add strong electrolyte solutions, they break apart into the ions. So if you notice a polyatomic ion in there, that polyatomic ion will stay as its ion self, and then the cation will also separate from that. Ah, so that's a good question. Um, one of the things, the difference between sodium, sodium metal, that would be like highly reactive with water, is that it's got that one extra electron. So we talked about this very briefly, but on the periodic table. So right, sodium, um, we know it forms a one plus charge. That's because it wants to lose one electron to be uh, to have the same number of valence electrons as the nearest noble gas. So if it loses one valence electron, then it'll have 10 valence electrons like neon. And so when we put sodium chloride, table salt, into water, um, what's happened is the sodium has actually given its electron to chlorine. And so when they enter the water, that's why we get Na+, and it doesn't have the properties of that sodium highly reactive metal. And then chlorine, on the opposite end of the periodic table, also wants to have the same number of valence electrons as the nearest noble gas, um, which is what makes it, as a gas by itself, so reactive and so dangerous. Um, it's because it's going around and it's stripping electrons off of other things. If it's already got that electron, it's like a bear that's been fed. <laughs> if that bear is just super stuffed and full, it's probably not going to attack you or unless it feels threatened by you. But right, like it's gonna be satiated, it's gonna be chilling. So the chlorine, Cl minus, has that one electron, it's happy. It doesn't need to go and steal electrons from other places. Cool, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah. all right. 
So we have some solutions, though, that do not dissolve in water, or some solids that don't dissolve in water. Obviously, you probably, I mean, sand doesn't dissolve in water. Um, but not all ionic common compounds will dissolve. One example of those is silver chloride. Um, so silver chloride will remain as a solid within water. If you pour it in, it will never dissolve. It'll just stay on the bottom. Um, so it does, not depend, it does not dissolve into independent ions of silver, Ag+, and chloride, Cl-. Um, we haven't talked much about bond strength, but these are um, this, the bond between the silver and the chlorine is stronger than the water trying to pull it apart. You can kind of think of water as a mob, and it's just trying to pull apart anything that enters the water. Um, it's one of the reasons water is called the universal solvent. It will eventually destroy anything. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's like a mob, and it's trying to tear the chlorine and the uh, silver ions apart. But the chloride and silver ions hold on to each other tighter than the mob can tear them apart. For these other ions, the mob gets to them and separates them. So uh, we have a, we have, well, what is solubility then? So it's like what things dissolve in water, what things don't dissolve in water. Um, a compound is soluble in a particular liquid if it dissolves in that liquid. So not necessarily, it doesn't have to dissociate into ions, it just has to dissolve. So uh, sugar, uh, sucrose is a good example of something. It doesn't dissociate into ions, but it does dissolve in water. A compound that is insoluble um, does not dissolve in the liquid. So if you add a solid to the liquid and it stays solid, and you can see it, one of the hallmark things of uh, something dissolving is that you'll have a clear solution afterwards. The color might change, but the solution will still be clear. Scam likely. No, thank you. Uh, so these are empirical rules, which just means that they're based on uh, research that people have done. They're based on, ex based on experiments. People said, okay, what happens if I add silver chloride to the water? Okay, it didn't dissolve, so they wrote that down. And what happens if I add um, potassium chloride to water? Oh, that does dissolve. So they took all these ionic compounds, added them to water, and then sort of tabulated them. Um, these are the solubility rules. And I know they're a little bit confusing to look at at first. Uh, the ones that you should definitely memorize are these uh, two rows that have no exceptions. So anything, any ionic compound that has lithium, potassium, or sodium, potassium, or ammonium will be soluble in water. Any compound that has nitrate or acetate will be soluble in water. So um, they're separated into cations and anions in that case. Uh, everything else has some exceptions. So when we're looking at this top portion, um, these are on the left, soluble, and then the exceptions to that are on the right. So these things would be insoluble. So the exceptions do not dissolve in water. On the bottom, it's switched. These are insoluble, and these exceptions will be soluble. Now there is some overlap, because here we have hydroxide and sulfide are going to be insoluble, do not dissolve in water, except when they're paired with lithium, sodium, potassium, or ammonium. Right? Those are these guys up here that don't have any exceptions, always soluble. Um, let's say, oh yeah, and there's lithium, sodium, potassium, ammonium there as well. Um, this is a table that definitely got to take some time to practice with it. I will put this table on the exam. It is up to you to know how to use it.
Yeah, yeah, yeah. You got to test the water. Yeah, test the water, and then you got to add more of this. Then you test the water again. You got to add more of that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we will get to pH. So you'll understand that even more. Uh, did you have a? Uh, is that for solubility in water specifically? Yes. These are all for solubility in water. Yes. We don't really talk about any other liquids in this class. We do mention. Uh, briefly talking about two liquids mixing together, and that's called miscibility, because it has to have a different word, so it's miscible or immiscible. Uh, I think that might even be part of today's lab. Or not today's, I guess you guys don't have lab today, but on Wednesday you'll have that. All right, so <clears throat> determining whether a compound is soluble. So I'm not gonna make you answer these, but we'll go, and these are get some good practice for working through that table. So here we have CUS, so what are the compounds here? What's the first compound, or first element, I should say? Copper, and the second element, sulfur. All right, so we have copper and sulfur, so we go back to our solubility table. And the first thing we can do is look to see if we have copper anywhere. Um, we don't have copper, I don't believe it's on this table at all, but we do have the sulfur as sulfide. So if we look at sulfide and it says compounds containing the following, mostly insoluble. And now we just need to see if copper is one of the exceptions. So this is for sulfur and calcium, strontium, or barium uh, would be soluble. Copper is not one of those. So this would be insoluble. And you might even want to write when you're practicing these that S2 minus mostly insoluble. Oops. Except, uh, what was it? Calcium, strontium, or barium. So bad. All right, what about this next compound? What are the elements that we have here? Or polyatomic ions? Iron, you say sulfate? It's sulfate. Yeah. I, I just couldn't, the, the, last, the last bit tailed off and I didn't hear you, so it's okay. Sulfur is good though, yeah. Sulfur compound, it's a sulfur polyatomic ion that has oxygen on it. Yeah, it's iron sulfate because your body can't absorb elemental iron. Um, okay, so iron, yeah, iron sulfate. So we're gonna come back up here. Um, and in general, it is better to check for the uh, anion first. There are more anions. So negatively charged ions, right? These are all negatively charged. The only positive ones are here and then in the exceptions. So we have sulfate and then we check. So when sulfate pairs with strontium, barium, lead, and lead two plus here specifically. So if it was lead three plus, that'd be different. And then calcium two plus, those would be insoluble. So is our compound iron two was iron to sulfate, is that going to be soluble or insoluble? It's going to be soluble. So soluble, and we could say SO4 to minus is mostly soluble, except, and then it was calcium 2 plus, strontium 2 plus, barium 2 plus, uh, oh wait, not calcium. No, it is calcium. Why is it in the same order? Weird. And then lead two plus. So 
And when you do this, hopefully you start to recognize some trends that, oh, maybe salts, or I should say not salts, but ionic compounds with calcium, strontium, and barium, soluble most of the time. Okay, so, I guess with sulfate, no, sulfate, the exception is that they're insoluble. Oh, this is why I give you the table, though, because there's a lot here to memorize. Um, all right, so this next compound, first element is lead, and the second one, carbon eight. Oh, well, I guess the ele second element is carbon, yeah. The anion here is carbon eight. Sorry. Poorly worded question. All right, so we have lead carbonate. So is carbonate mostly soluble or mostly insoluble? Insoluble. And then do we have one of the exceptions? Well, it's not one of the exceptions. So it'll be insoluble. And then CO3 two minus is mostly, mostly insoluble, except lithium, sodium, potassium, and ammonium. Which these ones, those are the four cations that are always soluble. <clears throat> so, even without going to the table, is ammonium chloride soluble or insoluble? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I just mentioned ammonium is one of those that's always soluble. So if we do go up, let's go up and take a look at the table, we have ammonium. And ammonium's uh, always soluble because it has no exceptions. Three rate soluble, and NH4 plus always soluble. So, I think solubil solubility rules aren't too hard, um, as long as you can use the table. The most important thing for these solubility rules is determining whether or not you have a precipitation reaction. Um, and we mentioned this very briefly, saw that solution of it was like a yellow liquid mixing with a clear liquid, and you got a red solution, I think those were the colors or a red cloud in it, um, a per, that was a precipitation reaction. So precipitation reactions in liquids are where you mix two liquids and you get a solid. It's kind of like when you have rain outside, it's also called precipitation. That's a liquid being formed in air. <clears throat> so, and we mentioned that sodium carbonate in laundry detergent will react with magnesium and calcium ions to remove them and uh, soften the water to make the detergent work better. And so those are uh, precipitation reactions because you're getting, uh, what's well, gonna be, I'll write it this way. So that would look like CO3, so carbonate is CO3 two minus, two minus plus, uh, let's just say magnesium, and we would get magnesium carbonate, solid. So if you have a metal, and you're trying to predict what the products are, that metal is always gonna go first in that compound. So if you ever see a chemical reaction, I should be more diligent about these. So we got two aqueous things reacting. This is the reaction arrow. And then they form a solid. That's a precipitation reaction. And this solid here is called the precipitate. So the thing, the solid that forms is the precipitate. So 
So another one that looks really nice is mixing potassium iodide uh, mixed with a solution of lead to nitrate forms a brilliant yellow precipitate of lead iodide. And so we've got the balanced chemical equation over here. So this is potassium iodide. We got lead to nitrate. We get potassium iodide solid. And then we get potassium nitrate also. So we've mixed lots of liquids to b before. Um, you don't always get a precipitate when you mix two solutions. Sometimes nothing happens. Um, in fact, most of the time I think nothing happens. Um, so in this case, we've got potassium iodide and sodium chloride solutions. And when we mix those together, nothing happens. Um, so there's no solid that forms. So we would say in this case there's no reaction because when we add potassium iodide plus sodium chloride, we get all of those ions because both of those are strong electrolyte solutions. So we just have now a beaker full of lots of different types of ions. But no solid form, so there's not really any reaction happening other than having dissolved ions. So the key for predicting a precipitation reaction is understanding that only insoluble only insoluble components form precipitates. And then only when there's a precipitate do you have a reaction. So if we did, uh, so sodium carbonate was the, uh, that's what's in laundry detergent to help it remove uh, magnesium and calcium. So if we also had, let's say magnesium chloride when these react, this is an example of a double displacement reaction, which we'll get to, but we'll get magnesium carbonate. Sorry, these are both aqueous. We'll get magnesium carbonate solid. And in this case, we would write out both of the uh, products. So sodium chloride would be the other one. That would stay aqueous. And then you would go and check, say, OK, with my two products, are either of these insoluble? So we could go back to the solubility table here, and we could check and see, oh, carbonate with magnesium is going to be solid. So then we write solid next to it. And we'd say that this reaction, or these two compounds, react to form this solid magnesium carbonate. So as we've talked about, if we have things that are soluble in water, they dissociate, as long as they're strong electrolytes, they dissociate into their ions. So if we have two separate beakers with dissolved ions in them, like here we have potassium iodide. So we've got potassium and iodide ions floating around. In our other beaker, we have lead nitrate, which is soluble in water. And so we've got nitrate ions, and we've got, or sorry, not potassium, lead, lead nitrate. And we have lead ions that are floating around. As soon as we mix those together, we have to start considering the possibility, the possible combinations of ions that we could get in our new solution that has all of the ions from both beakers in it. So if we added uh, potassium, iodide, lead, this is actually lead, two plus, and nitrate. What are the possible combinations that we could have? Can we have a positive charge and a positive charge together? No. So we can't have a, po can't have a positive charge, and we can't positive charge with a positive charge, and we can't have a negative charge with a negative charge. So we cannot combine these two. Those don't work. So those aren't other, those aren't possible combinations. So what would be another possible combination? Can 
Yeah, so we'll be combining the positive and the negatives. Yeah, so potassium with iodide and potassium with nitrate. Oops, don't want that negative charge. And then for lead, this is going to be lead 2 plus, so this will be lead iodide and lead nitrate. Now, in our original solutions, we already had potassium iodide and we had lead nitrate. And we, knew, we know, and we'll, you'll know from your chemical reaction, and we know here that those are both aqueous, right? This says aqueous. I've got them written out with their dissociated ions. So we know that this isn't going to have a reaction. And we know that this isn't going to be a reaction, because we already know that they're aqueous. We were told ahead of time. So the only ones that we need to check are the two other possibilities. So in a reaction where you have two ionic compounds, you only need to check the only two new combinations. Because we can't have a positive charge with a positive charge or a negative charge with a negative charge, so there's really only two options. Then that's going to be the lead nitrate, or sorry, the potassium nitrate and the lead iodide. So we go back, or actually we can scroll down because, so we would check then on the solubility table is lead iodide going to be soluble or insoluble, and is potassium going to be soluble, potassium nitrate soluble or insoluble? And we find that lead iodide is the only one that is insoluble, so it precipitate. So a reaction then would look like potassium iodide, aqueous, plus lead nitrate, aqueous, forms lead iodide, solid, plus potassium nitrate. And then we'd have to balance that. But you can see that even though we have written it here as potassium nitrate, in our actual solution, it's still potassium floating around and still nitrate floating around. So they're not really associated inside the solution. Um, and so we have actually special equations, special ways of writing out chemical equations that cover that. It's like, well, these things don't actually do anything, so do they actually matter? Um, I think we're going to get there. So maybe after this. So to formalize um, writing equations for precipitation reactions, you write the formulas of the two compounds being mixed, so two compounds being mixed as reactants. So that was our, in this case, um, potassium iodide, I'll just even write it this, potassium iodide plus lead nitrate. And then below the equation, we'll write the formulas of the ions. So everything's dissociated because you're both aqueous. So we'll have K plus I minus PB2 plus and NO3 minus. And then we'll exchange the anions and rewrite the ion formulas below the product side of the equation. So here it's we had lead iodide and we had, sorry, potassium iodide and lead nitrate. So we'll switch the anions. Which one's the anion? Is it the positive or the negative charge? Negative. negative charge. So we'll swap our negative charges. So then I'll write K plus with NO3 minus and PB2 plus with I minus, and then you'll have to balance their charges with each other. So we'll get potassium nitrate, and we'll have lead iodide. We need two iodides, because iodide has a one minus charge and the lead has a 
two plus charge. So then we would use solubility to rules, solubility rules to determine if either of the new pairs of ions is insoluble. So this one, as we know, is insoluble. And so we would indeed have a precipitation reaction. If we didn't have one that was, was insoluble, then we write no reaction. So if both pairs are soluble, write no reaction. Nothing happens. If one or both of the new pairs is insoluble, use uh, AQ to in indicate the soluble, and S to indicate insoluble, or that it's a solid. And then you can balance the equation by adding coefficients. Any questions so far? Any? So write an equation for the precipitation reaction that occurs, if any, when solutions of potassium hydroxide and nickel to bromide are mixed. Again, nomenclature. So uh, what is, what's potassium hydroxide? What's the chemical formula? KOH, yep, hydroxide is OH. And nickel to bromide. And I, BR, how many bromines do I need though? If it's nickel two, yeah, two. So this would be Ni2 plus, BR minus, K minus, or sorry, K plus, OH minus. All right, so we've got to balance those charges. All right, so now we've got our two reactants. These are aqueous. So we'll first write out all of the individual ions. So this is going to be K plus plus OH minus, and this will be Ni. 2 plus plus Br minus. And I swap the anions. So I'm just going to write K plus over here. I'm going to write Ni2 plus. We'll just keep the cations in the same order because it makes things easier. So now I swap the anions. So this will be potassium and what anion? Br minus, because it was with nickel in the reactant, so it swaps the trade partners. And this will be nickel and hydroxide. So now you got to scroll all the way back up and find the solubility rules. So potassium, one of the ones that's always soluble. So we know potassium bromide is going to be soluble, but now we're looking for nickel hydroxide. Here we go. So we have hydroxide here in the mostly insoluble. And then we can look at exceptions. Uh, actually, we have these exceptions down here too. But lithium, pota or sodium, potassium, ammonium. But we have nickel. So it's not any of those. And it's not calcium, strontium, or barium. So is this soluble or insoluble? Insoluble. So we do have a solid. So this is insoluble. But now we can rewrite these up here as a part of our chemical reaction. And this first one is soluble, so it's AQ. And then what do I write for the nickel hydroxide? Oh yeah, we'll have S. And then the formula will be OH2. And then we need to balance this. 
So is there any place, we're going back to last week, is there any place that's a better place to start when balancing this one? Or a best place? Or are they all about the same? <clears throat> so let's see, the rules were, if anything, so you, you want to balance any, anything that's in only one compound on either side of the chemical reaction. And so potassium here is only in one thing in the reactants, and it's only in part of one thing the products. Everything here is only part of one compound. The other one was if anything exists as an element by itself, balance that last. But we don't have anything here that exists as an element by itself. So for this one, and for actually all of the doubles, this is another double displacement, um, there's not really a best place to start because um, oh, it stopped working. Cool. There's not really a best place to start, though, because um, we don't have either of those two conditions. Hopefully this will, all right, there we go. There's the nickel two hydroxide. Yeah, so it doesn't really matter where we start here. We just start somewhere. Um, and usually, just start on the left. So if we look at potassium, then potassium is balanced. And then I would check bromine because Really, we're gonna, what we're gonna do is we're gonna bounce back and forth. So we're gonna start here, we'll go over here. I'll say potassium is balanced, one on both sides. And then bromine, we check here, and then we look on the other side, and bromine is not balanced. So where do I put a two? In front of K, right? We're changing coefficients, the numbers in front, not the numbers, not the subscripts. <clears throat> so that's balanced. So now we'll go over here, since we balance bromine, and we'll say, okay, is nickel balanced? And there's one there, there's one over here, so that's balanced. And then we'll look at hydroxide. Let's say there's two hydroxides here, and then hydroxide's also over there, and it's not balanced. So we'll add another coefficient out here. And now, if we went through and checked everything, it all should be balanced. All right, so let's write the uh, equation for the precipitation reaction that occurs, if any, between ammonium chloride and iron three nitrate. So what's the chemical formula for ammonium nit or ammonium chloride? Mm -hmm. It's gonna be NH4 plus, and this is Cl minus, so this will be NH4 Cl. That's aqueous. And what is iron three nitrate? Fe3 plus and NO3 minus. What would the balanced chemical formula be? Start with. Fe, the three plus is the charge. So how many nitrates do I need to balance out the charge on iron? Nitrate is a minus. Iron's a three plus. Yeah. Oh, I see, two more. Yeah, 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 so we need three total. Yeah. Yes, I see what you're saying. Yeah, I was looking for just the total, but yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. Adding two more in there, so we have a total of three balances those charges. <clears throat> okay, so now we gotta write out these as their ions, NH4 plus, plus Cl minus, Fe3 plus, plus nitrate, NO3 minus, 
and then I'm going to write out the writing out the cations first. So this is NH4 plus and Fe3 plus, and now we swap the anions. So it's going to be ammonium, ammonium, and what anion? Nitrate. And then it'll be iron and which the only other remaining anion? Chloride. So then if we want to balance these charges, this one actually stays the same. Ammonium nitrate, NH4, NO3. Oh, I forgot to do this. This is aqueous. That's aqueous. I guess we didn't check to see if this is going to be aqueous or if it's going to be soluble or insoluble, I should say. All right, so let's go back. We've got iron chloride. Oops, missed it. All right, so do we have iron or chloride? And which section is it in? Chloride is in the mostly soluble. And then the only exceptions are silver, mercury, or it's mercury 2, 2 plus, and then lead 2 plus. So soluble or insoluble? It's soluble, yeah. So we come back here. We say, well, that was really great practice and everything, but no reaction. So it would also be aqueous. And on a problem like this, don't just write, you know, write out the two, two things and write aqueous, aqueous. You've got to have no reaction. So if you ever get everything is soluble, then no reaction. Already. Any questions? Precipitation reactions? Almost exclusively double displacements. Okay. So we'll do another one of these. <clears throat> So we've got potassium sulfate this time and strontium nitrate. So potassium sulfate, what would the, what's the formula for potassium sulfate? K sulfate, sulfur, yeah, SO4, so potassium is K plus, sulfate is SO4, two minus, Close. <laughs> I, appreci I, I appreciate it. I appreciate your efforts. <laughs> you saying something. The rest of you can pick up the slack. Uh, okay. And then strontium nitrate. SR. SR2 plus. And then there's the nitrate, NO3 minus. So for a chemical reaction, this will be K2, SO4, plus SR, and then we need two nitrates, <clears throat> move this over a bit. Okay, so in part of what we're doing now is, right, I'm, I'm writing out the ions on top, just to help us with the nomenclature, but um, we rewrite those ions down here. So for two minus, and then this is gonna be SR2 plus, NO3 minus. Ah, well, if potassium is plus, one plus, and sulfate is two minus, you have to have two potassiums. Yeah, so when you're writing out the chemical formulas, write out the ions and their charges first, and then make sure they balance. So what should I write first on the product, underneath the product side? So 
someone new. How have I been doing this for all the rest of them? Yeah. And then you switch the anions, yeah. So skip ahead of stuff there a little bit, but yeah, potassium and nitrate and then strontium and sulfate. I don't know if we balanced the last one, but <clears throat> oh, we didn't have to because it was no reaction. So now, potassium and nitrate are both uh, ions that are always soluble, but strontium and sulfate uh, might not be. So we scroll back up, we've got strontium and sulfate. So strontium and sulfate, who thinks it's gonna be soluble? Oh, not potassium sulfate, strontium sulfate. So yeah, who thinks it's insoluble? So you have sulfate. We're looking at strontium sulfate. Yeah, so this would be, so we look over here first and we say, okay, these are mostly soluble. Okay. So strontium, or sorry, not strontium, sulfate, mostly soluble, except when sulfate pairs with strontium, barium, lead, or calcium. And we're looking at strontium sulfate. So strontium is an exception. So strontium sulfate would be insoluble. So the uh, exceptions are like a reverse UNO card. Oh, okay. Yeah, they flip it. So if it's in the mostly soluble section, it's in an exception that's a reverse, now it's insoluble. <clears throat> so yeah, this one's insoluble. There it is. So this is insoluble. And so we can write this, and here also, balancing the charges between the cation and the anion, right? So potassium nitrate, it's just one of the, each of those, there's one plus, one minus. And then actually for strontium sulfate, also already balanced, that's a solid. And now we only need to add one coefficient to balance this reaction. Where would that coefficient be? And what is it? Yeah, two on potassium nitrate. So you see we got on the left here two potassium and two nitrate. So if we change potassium nitrate, put a two in front of it, it's balanced. Okay, I think that was the last one. Last of the uh, those reactions. All right, so I mentioned earlier before we did all of those practice ones, um, we have ways for writing out these ionic uh, are these really precipitation reactions or any reactions that involve um, aqueous ions. Now, the way we've been writing stuff is the molecular equation, which shows the complete neutral formulas for every compound in the reaction. So everything has to be balanced with something else in the solution. That's the molecular formula. The complete ionic equation um, we'll show all of our aqueous ionic compounds as their ions. <clears throat> and so when you're writing these, uh, separate only aqueous ionic compounds into their constituent ions. That would be something like, actually if we just take this reaction that we just did. Oh, I didn't wanna do that. Copy. So if I take this reaction and I want to write it out 
as an ionic, a complete ionic equation. I would write this out as 2K plus, because there's two potassium ions that come from the potassium sulfate, plus SO4 two minus, plus SR2 plus, plus two NO3 minus, and then 2K plus, plus two NO3 minus, and then plus, and the strontium uh, sulfate here is solid. So we'll leave that as SR, SO4. Right, so we took each of those ionic compounds that was aqueous and we separated it back out into its ions. <clears throat> and what this lets us do is actually see which of the ions are actually participating in any kind of reaction at all. Because remember, when we have our two separate solutions, they're both just separated ions mixed around. And so if we pour those two together and those ions stay separated, don't become part of any um, solid, then they're still just floating around and they never actually did anything, really changed from one solution to the other. So in this case, we have potassium, use highlighter on this one. We have potassium, which is, was floating around in our reactants and is still just floating around in our products. And then the same thing could be said about nitrate here. So nitrate here in the complete ionic equation is still just nitrate on the other side. So we can actually say that those don't participate in the reaction. And really the only thing that's happening is strontium reacting with sulfate. So those ions are called spectator ions because they're just sitting around watching. They remain unchanged. They don't participate. Um, and the key here, it's unchanged on both sides of the equation. So we can simplify our equations and we can write those, or we can omit those or leave them out. Let me copy this. All right, so we can take these spectator ions and we can just remove them from the reaction. And so our new reaction would be written as, and our net ionic, re, or net ionic equation is SO4 two minus plus SR2 plus is SRSO4 solid. So this would be the net ionic equation. Oh, and yeah, we should def define a species is just like a thing in the solution. So it's just another way to say like this compound in the solution, that species in the solution, same thing. All right. So summarizing these different types of equations, so different ways to represent what's happening in a solution. You have the molecular equation shows everything, and it shows it in its neutral form. There's the complete ionic equation, and actually let me release neutral formulas for every compound. The complete ionic equation shows all the um, species, and it's as they actually are, or actually present in solution. So they, when you add, sodium chloride to a solution, it's not NaCl, it's sodium ions and chloride ions. So that's how it actually is in the solution. And then the net ionic equation shows only the species that actually participate in the reaction. So anything that just stays floating around in solution um, gets dropped and you get a much more concise equation. So if we consider this reaction, uh, we had a complete, a complete ionic equation and a net ionic equation for the reaction above. So this is actually very similar to when we were predicting the products of pers per precipitation reactions. My mouth really wanted to say participation reactions. Uh, precipitation reactions. So we're gonna take 
uh, each of these that is aqueous, and we're going to write it as its individual ions. So what do I write for HBr, hydrobromic acid? What are the constituent ions? Which one has the positive charge? Uh huh. H? Yeah, we write 2H plus plus 2Br minus plus, what would be next? So now we're into calcium hydroxide. CA, what charge does that calcium have? Two, it's two plus. Two ways you could get that. One of them is uh, from the periodic table. The other one, because it has two hydroxides. So then this would be two OH minus. So there's two of those hydroxides. And then water, H2O, is a liquid. So we leave that as it is. So this would be 2 H2O plus calcium again, still Ca2 plus, plus 2 Br minus. And the reason that you keep those coefficients and keep the numbers of them is that now in our complete ionic equation, so this is complete ionic equation. In our complete ionic equation, it stays balanced. And that means when we go to the net ionic equation, it will also be balanced. So what are our spectator ions in this net ionic, or in this complete ionic equation? Which ions stay exactly the same? Well, water is, do we have it in the reactants? Yeah, so the spectator ions are the ones that are in the reactants and the products. So there's calcium 2 plus is the same. Just one more. Bromine, 2Br minus. So those are our spectator ions. So when we write our net ionic equation, we'll remove those. So this will be 2 H plus plus 2 OH minus it's 2 H2O. So in this case, we could simplify it to just be H plus plus OH minus is H2O. This is the net ionic. Let me write this over here. Spectator ions are in green. <coughs> Pretty good. All right, we'll, we'll leave it there because we're going to be getting into a whole other topic.